Hello, welcome to this section of Circuit Analysis Tutor. Here we're going to finally introduce the concept of the capacitor. You know, capacitors are in virtually every circuit in every device that you could rip apart and look at. Much like the inductor, if you look on a circuit board, you'll see even more capacitors everywhere. And there's lots and lots of uses for capacitors, but for the time being, I just want you to kind of think of it as an energy storage device, just like the inductor was. Now in the previous sections we talked about inductors and we said inductors store energy because the current flowing through an inductor generates a magnetic field and magnetic fields fundamentally are basically just mediums to store energy, potential to do work. And you can put energy in the bank, you can take energy out of the bank, and that's all in the context of inductors. And I hinted several times that capacitors are going to have very similar characteristics the only difference is capacitors are going to deal and do deal with the electric field instead of magnetic fields. So I've said it a couple times now, but electric field and magnetic field are kind of like peanut butter and jelly. They go together. Uh, you change the electric field. You, get a, you can get a magnetic field to be generated. You can change the magnetic field. You can get an electric field to be generated. They're very close cousins of one another, and they influence one another. So we have a device that operates on the principles of a magnetic field. That's the inductor. Now we have the capacitor that is fundamentally governed by the principles of the electric field. And so having those two guys, those two kind of opposites at our disposal lets us do all kinds of really great things with circuits. So first, let's crawl before we can walk. Uh, what is the symbol for a capacitor? So capacitor symbol. There's a couple of different symbols that you might see. I just want to make sure that you know that you might see a couple of different things. So here is a flat line with a curved line. right? So you might see something like that. You might also just see it as two parallel plates like that. Either one is fine. It just depends on the circuit diagram that you're looking at, but ultimately, the symbol for a capacitor is going to have a plate and another plate. Sometimes it might be curved, sometimes it might not be curved, and there's a gap between them where they're not touching, and I'll explain why that's important in just a few minutes. Now, the unit of a capacitor, right? So remember, for resistance, it's ohms. For inductance, it's henrys. For capacitors, it's farads, F-A-R-A-D, farad, right? But uh, farad is a very large unit of capacitance, so you never, ever, ever, ever gonna see a, a one farad or a three farad capacitor. It would be like the size of a room. So usually what you'll see is you'll see, and by the way, this is F, usually you'll see something like microfarad. So you might have a three microfarad capacitor or a 25 microfarad capacitor or a hundred microfarad capacitor. Or you might even see picofarad capacitors, those teeny tiny capacitors, if you open a computer and look on the board and you see just hundreds of them all over the place, because capacitors are used everywhere, the teeny tiny ones are probably in the picofarad range, which are even smaller. Um, very rare for you to see a millifarad capacitor, that would be something industrial, very large, and you're just never gonna see a one farad capacitor. So get used to seeing micro a lot in terms of capacitances, all right? So let's take a moment and draw a larger version of this capacitor down below so that I can make some observations for you. So here we have terminal A, let's say, right? So here's this guy and then the other parts on the other side and then we have, let's say, terminal B, all right? And then let's just say we have a current flow through the capacitor like that so according to our passive sign convention, we would expect to have a voltage like this, all right? So plus or minus. So notice that for resistors, if you have current flow through a resistor, we have a plus or minus voltage drop. For inductors, we assume that we have a current flow in that direction, we have plus or minus voltage drop. And for capacitors, if we have current flow that way, we have plus or minus voltage drop. Do you see a pattern here? Yes, when we have current flowing certain direction across a device, we always assume the voltage is dropping, but as you'll find in a minute, the actual direction of V, the polarity, might be different because you'll see in a second, there's gonna be some derivatives involved, just like there was for the inductor. All right, now one more thing I wanna get that before I get to that part of it is, what we have in a capacitor fundamentally what it actually is, is you have a plate, which is literally like a, think about a piece of paper, a metal piece of paper, a plate. And then next to it, you have another plate. Don't worry about the fact that it's curved. That, that doesn't really matter for now. Sometimes you'll see flat, sometimes you'll see curved, but ultimately it's another plate. 
they're not touching here, right? So there's no electrical connection through here. So, you know, for the inductor and the resistor, there was always a physical path all the way through the device, but for a capacitor, there's actually a gap in there. If you actually sliced a capacitor in half, put it under a microscope and looked at it, you would see the wire come in, there'd be kind of a plate, sometimes they're wrapped up, but then you would see a gap, a very small gap, so it's not actually touching the other side where the other terminal comes out. Now, the way I've drawn it here, it's got a blank space in there. Uh, you can kind of think of that as air, right? But in general, capacitors don't usually have air in between them. Usually, we kind of shade it like this, and we say that this inside here is what we call a dielectric, which just means insulator. All right, so fundamentally, a capacitor can have different dielectrics inside. Capacitor could have, remember we talked about the inductor. We said we could have different things inside the inductor, usually metal like iron, to concentrate the magnetic field. Well here, we're not dealing with magnetic field, we're dealing with electric fields, and I'll explain why in a minute, but we can fill different dielectrics in there and that helps to govern the capacitance. It, help, it basically uh, governs the value of the capacitor you have. Uh, is, it depends on what's in between there. In fact, the capacitance of a capacitor is, is, is governed by a couple things. It's governed by the dielectric that you have. It's also governed by how large these plates are, the surface area of these plates. But for now, just think about a capacitor as being one flat plate with another flat plate right next to it but not touching with something in the middle filled and that something is called a dielectric and that's an insulator. So this could be rubber inside there. Sometimes they make rubber capacitors. Um, they could actually have glass in there and some specialty capacitors. You could have, uh, you know, plastic in there. There's all kinds of different things that you can make with the capacitor and it's going to change the characteristics of the capacitor just slightly. So it depends on the application. But the fundamental thing at 100,000 feet for you to realize is that there is no touching of these plates. They do not touch in there. Very, very important. All right. So, what we're going to do now is uh, I'm going to write down the equation that governs the current flow through this capacitor. Uh, but before I do that, I want to try to describe basically what's going on here, okay? So you might ask yourself, at least that's what I did when I first saw this, I asked myself, okay, so there's a plate here, and there's another plate real close to it, but not touching. And inside's like rubber or some kind of a dielectric insulator that doesn't conduct electricity. So how can I have current flowing through this device if there's actually no connection in there? It's like having a wire here and a wire here and nothing in between and I'm saying electric current's flowing. How can that possibly be happening, right? I'm glad you're asking these questions because they're very important questions for you to understand. We're gonna address that now. What we say, when we say that current is flowing through there, is we mean that from the outside looking in, like forgetting about what's happening in there, it looks as if current is flowing through the device. No current's actually ever really flowing through the device because you can't actually tunnel through an insulator. Electricity is, is not gonna do that. But you can kind of be fooled into thinking that current's flowing because if you think about it, think about this plate right here, this capacitor plate. Let's pretend that it's very large. Let's say that I make a plate like you know the size of a basketball court, right? And that's a, very, a piece of metal plate connected to a wire. And then I create another plate really close together to it, and I put it right close together. Now let's say I turn a current source on to send some, uh, you know, some positive current up through here, going through like that. What is actually going to happen? Well, we know that this current cannot just jump over to the other side. It can't complete the circuit like a typical circuit arrangement. But if you think about current I being positive charges. I mean, we all know that electrons really are the thing that are going around the circle in the circuit. But we've established a long time ago that we don't usually talk about electrons flowing in our circuits in electrical engineering. We talk about positive current flow, which is opposite of the electron flow. So when you see this current I, you should be thinking of positive, uh, positive current flow, positive charges flowing, which is opposite of the electron flow. But anyway, if I had positive charges going through this wire, they're gonna hit this plate. So what's gonna happen? That positive charge is gonna stick on that plate. It can't jump to the other side, but it's gonna stay there. It's gonna pile up. Now after a few seconds or some length of time, the current's gonna keep coming in, coming in, coming in. If this plate is large enough, in fact, in our example, we said it was as large as a you know, basketball 
uh, stadium or something like that. If the plate is physically large enough, then it, it has plenty of surface area for all these positive charges coming in just to pile up, right? Keep piling up, piling up, piling up, piling up. So what's going to happen after a while is that this plate of this capacitor, because the current coming in, it's going to charge up positive because it's literally in the way and all of these positive charges are piling up. If I have a teeny tiny capacitor, very small, then the capacitance is very negligible, then I'm going to be able to pile up some positive charge but not very many because it's physically small. But if I create a capacitor really large, like as large as this room, where the plate is incredibly large, and maybe I take the two plates with that gap and I wrap them up in a cylinder so I have lots of surface area between the plates, right, then those plates can accept a lot of positive charge that can pile up here um, before it just can't fill up anymore. So even though there's no connection across the circuit, this plate can charge up positive is what I'm trying to say, it can charge. So when we say a capacitor charges, that's what's happening. It's literally a gap and there's a lot of surface area there. So those incoming positive charges just kind of get stuck at the end. They have nowhere else to go, so they just pile up. Notice that our voltage is plus to minus. If the current flow is this way, and if this plate is charging up with positive charges, then it would make sense that this side of the capacitor would be positive, which is exactly how I have it labeled. Now also think about it, if this side's positive, you know, if I go down and put a lot of positive charges here, you know, positive, 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 lots of positive charges have piled up here, then what's going to end up happening is I'm going to have um, an electric field set up by all of these charged particles. Think about back to physics. What is an electric field? An electric field is just some field that arises when you have a large amount of positive charges present, or negative charges present also. But anyway, we're talking about positive things here. So positive charges present, the more of them you have, the stronger your electric field is. An electric field, in turn, can cause charged particles to be pushed around and influence their motion. But in terms of generating an electric field, the way to do it is by piling up a lot of charges. So what's really going to happen here, let me erase the dielectric. The dielectric's still inside there. Just, you know, don't forget that it's still there, but, it, you know, I'm erasing it for clarity right now. So what's going to happen is this electric field is going to be generated inside the capacitor, pointing from one plate to the next. This is kind of a physics discussion, really, but that's what's really happening. So there's an electric field. An electric field, I'll label it right here as E, with a vector on top. The electric field points from the positive plate of the capacitor to the other plate. Now, what do you think is going to happen to this other plate? Notice there's tons of positive charges here, and it's very, I've drawn it far apart, but they're very close, almost touching this other plate uh, there. Well, there's lots of atoms on this other plate that have electrons uh, there. And so what's going to end up happening is the positive charges that are over here are going to be kind of repelled away. And so what you're going to have is a negative charge on the other side, like that. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is really what's going on inside of a capacitor. And you don't need to know, you don't need to know in detail these, these this charge distribution. I'm just trying to explain to you how it works. And then as we do circuits, then you'll understand. What's basically going on is you send positive current, positive charge, just think of it in that way, going in here. They hit a plate, which is like a brick wall, and they pile up. When they start to pile up, an electric field is generated inside there, which then repels all the positive charges that are on the other plate. It pushes them away. Because remember, like charges tend to repel. So any positive charges that were here get pushed, and any negative charges get pulled in. So what's really happening is you have a, po a pile up of positive charges, and then all the electrons that are over here get sucked over to this plate, and so you have plus and minus, and electric field always starts at plus and ends at minus. So you have an arrow there representing the strength of that electric field. Now, the larger the plates, the more charge that can build up, then the stronger the electric field can be inside of that uh, capacitor. So it makes sense that uh, that that's the case there. And if you have a very small capacitor, one of those picoferric capacitors, really teeny tiny, then there's not very much capacitor plate surface area, cannot accept as many charges without filling up, and so it just can't generate as much of an electric field. So it, the capacitor effect, the storage effect, is just not able to manifest itself as much for a small capacitor as opposed to a large capacitor. Now, where is the energy being stored in this capacitor? I said that for an inductor, the energy was being stored in the magnetic field. In the capacitor, the energy is being stored in this electric field. 
That's just physics. That's something you can go and review in physics. When you have an electric field, by definition, you have potential energy. Right? It has the potential to do something, just like storing the magnetic field has the potential to do something also. So it's just like that rubber band analogy I used for the, for the, uh, for the inductor. When I add those charges, it's like I'm pulling that rubber band back, I'm giving potential energy into this capacitor. I'm putting energy into the bank. And really the way it's happening is because I'm piling these charges up. If I disconnect the circuit and take the capacitor out of my computer or whatever and walk around with it, the charges are still piled up inside there. And the electric field is still inside there. So then I can take that capacitor and hook it into another circuit and bleed the charge out. And I'm, re I'm basically removing the energy that was in there by bleeding off or discharging the capacitor later on. So much like inductors, where you can store energy and then you can take energy later, capacitors is the same thing, except it's all done in terms of the electric field and with the charges that are stored. It's specifically designed to accept lots of charges, store energy in that, in that field, and then later on you can take that energy out, just like we were able to do for the inductor.